The data set that I found is called Urban Sound. You can find it yourself on Kaggle. I found it somewhere else. I think it had been copied from Kaggle. Um, but I think that if you follow along here, you can, uh, you'll be able to, to find the same files and, and do approximately the same thing that I'm going to attempt to do. So there's a link to uh, the resource. You can find other resources there and, and lots of good information. So here's what I did. I've uh, extracted the, uh, the zip file that comes down. It's going to have some CSV files inside of it uh, that describe the classes for the sounds. And then you're also going to have directories full of just WAV files. Okay. So the very first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to load up the essential libraries, pandas, uh, NumPy, um, Matplotlib for graphing, load them up. And I want to read the training file. This is this training CSV file. I'm loading it up with pandas. Uh, and I'm showing you the first six rows or the head of the file, as well as the last six rows. You will find that there is a corresponding file for every number that's an ID in the file. So if you go onto your local drive, you can load up one of these. And I'm going to do that here. I load up, um, I'm loading up from the training directory 6.wav. I'm just loading it up as a regular file in Python, and then I'm going to use this little library IPD audio file to play it back. This is what it sounds like. That's coming through a little laptop speaker, so that may not be as easy for you to hear. I'm not sure, <laughs> but it's. I'll play it one more time. It's the sound of uh, children playing. I think I can hear a ball being smacked around. Maybe they're playing basketball or dodgeball, something like that. Um, so that we know that's what the audio sounds like, but what does it look like visually? So we're going to use the very helpful Librosa Python library. It's just an all around helpful library for dealing with audio data. So we, we when you load the file name, it gives you back an array um, that includes all of the samples within, the, which is this, what's the data, right? And then the sampling rate. And I print out here a couple of uh, just a couple of informative pieces, and I've already run this before, so it's, it's it's down below. You're seeing the output, print the shape and the sampling rate, and then the data type. So the shape is eight uh, eighty eight thousand two hundred, and that's really just an array. It's a single. The shape is actually just a one dimensional array of eight the eighty eight thousand two hundred samples, and the sampling rate being twenty two thousand fifty. That's now, so sampling rate works like this. This is how many individual numbers or samples there are representing the amplitude of the, the sound as it was sampled in one second, right? So if you've ever used something like Audacity, you'll be familiar with uh, visualization of audio. It looks a lot like this, right? So just visually, I can look at this and say, oh, I see that looks like sound. So I just had started to discuss briefly um, training on raw data and is it feasible? So the short answer is yes, it's feasible. Uh, well, let's say it's possible. <laughs> feasible, maybe not. Possible, yes. Um, that's known as uh, self-supervised learning, and it's not always the best approach. Often you will find that you'll have better luck by extracting meaningful features out of the raw data and then use that to train on instead. So if you have any experience uh, working with audio, like if, like I'm an audio head, I like music, I like to record, I'm like an amateur producer, I've been you know, monkeying around with, with sound files for a long time. So if you're that kind of a guy, you're going to look at that and go, oh, it's a waveform. But you typically can't visually understand what the sound is just from that. You can say, oh, there's some kind of noise floor. There's a, there's some kind of something's going on in there that's making sound. And I can see there's some spikes. So something got loud a couple of times through that waveform. But that's very vague. That's not a lot a lot to go on. I mean, I can't look at that and go, is it a is it a, a, a yard full of dogs and one of them is like excited and running around and the other one's like barking at them? I mean, it could be and it might not look so different uh, visually just looking at this. And so just taking the raw data itself, I'm not sure that that's going to be enough to train on. It's possible. I've seen other examples where people have done it, but it may not be the best approach. Also, we have um, the class names are basically strings or the class names are strings. Um, and how many of those do we even have? Well, let's take a look real quick. So I, I run this uh, labels class unique on the uh, the data frame that I have, and I print out the result, and then I uh, then factorize the classes. This is just a way to take strings and quickly turn them into numbers, because whenever you get into uh, learning, you're not going to be working with strings at all. Everything has to be converted into a number. 
and that's all that's about just a string to integer uh, type conversion and then i created a little dictionary and a reverse dictionary just real quick so that whenever i'm going back and forth in this uh in this notebook i can you know take a number turn into a string back and forth right so I printed out those three results. So here's basically all of our unique class labels, right? Sirens, st street music, drilling, dog barking, children playing. These are the types of sounds that we have in all of our audio files. That's everything's gonna fall into one of those classes. And then uh, this next output here is where I, uh, I did the, the factorize. Basically, it's just gonna assign a number to each one of these. Now let's load up a handful of the files that are on the, the drive for the sake of just kind of examining them in the raw format. And um, again, I would have some additional steps here if I was going to get into feature extraction, but I'm not going to do that yet in this video. So uh, basically, I'm just saying for all of the files we have, I don't want to even load up all the files. Actually, I did this earlier. It's just too much data, right? So you have a bunch of different audio files. If I were to build an array and load up all for every second of audio, bring in 22,050 samples. Well, it gets to becoming kind of, uh, before you know it, you're gonna hear the whirring of my hard drive and eventually you might get an out of memory error because it's just a lot of data. So uh, instead for this, this, the sake of this, this video, I just limited it to the first 10 files that I see on the disk. So we can talk about it. And for each one of those, I run it through Librosa load as I did above, just to get back the data and the rate. Um, I pull out the uh, the base uh, the file name basically, so I can know how to kind of correlate that number back to the class. Uh, did a couple little quick conversions there, so I could print them out the results. Um, if you were going to do this on raw data, if you're going to train on raw data, the length would have to be the same every single time. Why is that? Well, because that's the way it always works with training data. Any time you're training, each sample will be an array of numbers, and they have to be at the same length. Otherwise, the math doesn't work out. It just, you're going to get errors. You just can't do that. You have to have them. They all have to be the same length. When that means for us is if we are looking at the raw data and we have a fixed sampling rate, and we do, it's 22050, which luckily is, it's actually kind of nice. Librosa um, will convert, no matter what the file format is, how it's stored, whatever sampling rate, it'll convert it all to a common sampling rate, and you can actually specify that. So uh, once you load that up, for it to be uh, exactly even, for every array to be the same same length, then the time series is going to have to have the same number of units in it. So basically, if we have four second samples, then we're gonna it's going to be basically uh, what is it, eighty eight? Actually, I think I see right in here the eighty eight thousand two hundred for a four second sound. And most of the samples that I looked at here, when I just did my little handful, I just grabbed like eight or ten of them out. I grabbed ten out. Uh, and I printed out the output, and you can see that they're almost all exactly four seconds of length, but some of them are shorter. So to keep this easy for me, I just said let's just uh, let's just ensure that the the array size matches uh, four seconds. And again, I this was only if you're dealing with this with raw. If we're going to actually try to train on raw data, that we need to do this. If we're pulling out feature extractions, it's possible that they don't have to exactly line up, and I'll get into that in just a bit. The, the end result array will need to be of the same length but the actual samples like wouldn't have to necessarily be because you're extracting higher order information about the audio. Okay, um, let's see what let's do. So in my case, I just drop it off uh, and then I want to get my training labels. So I just take the, uh, I just basically take the same files that I just loaded and I looked them up as I went through and I said, hey, what's your file name? Pull off the number and uh, then let's get the corresponding label and let's convert that to a number and let's just pack it into the training label. So here we have our array of training labels, seven, eight, eight, seven, four. So, so what was seven and eight? Let's go back up here and look real quick. Seven and eight, uh, seven's an air conditioner and eight's a jackhammer. So as we said, we're not so sure that raw data is gonna be the best way to deal with this. So let's talk about feature extraction. What can we extract from the audio that's gonna be a little bit more useful? And um, the first thing that I'm going to try is pulling it out as a spectrogram. So a spectrogram is uh, basically going to say, for a spectrogram, I'm going to say, here's a four second audio snippet. Now, the spectrogram is going to basically pull out the frequency. So it's like, if you can imagine, you've got a big EQ here. For the time series left to right, we're going to say, how much power do we have at that time? And what you end up with is this nice little grid that shows you, you know, how hot it is. So you can visually, this is actually more visually easy, uh, I can visually and you can visually, you and I can visually 
examine this and actually make some sense out of this looks a little bit different than this. So, so here we have our, our air conditioner. We can see that it looks like there's kind of a, whatever the sound is, it's kind of even evenly distributed. There's some low end down here, probably it's the red area down here at the bottom. And there's, that's where it's hotter. It's where the amplitude is hotter uh, throughout the, the, the bottom end. So visually a, a, a spectrogram is actually a, a pretty decent way to kind of look at the waveform and see where all of the energy is, where it's the higher, whether it's low. Now here we've got a jackhammer and you got a lot more low in energy. It's still kind of consistent. But it's like, it looks like it's going like, I, I imagine this because it drops off here. Okay. So I imagine it's like, nothing, nothing, nothing. And that's probably about what it sounds like. I could test that. Um, here we have another one. It's hard to, to really compare this one because the data has not been normalized, but we'll do that in a subsequent step. Normalizing the uh, audio means trying to bring the loudness level to be similar so that when we're comparing, it's it's in, within the same kind of range. So we'll want to normalize that. So that's another jackhammer here. Here's another air conditioner. You can just even visually, you can see this air conditioner looks more similar to the other air conditioner file than it does the jackhammers. I mean, already we're, we're starting to visually pick up on the differences between the sound files. Here's another one, pretty even. The children playing here is kind of like all over the place, right? You see all these, uh, the, the energy is all throughout the, the, the power spectrum here. So we can see as, as time, there's all kinds of clanks and noises and things that are kind of bouncing all over the place. It's not very ordered. It's not, it doesn't look like, like an air conditioner makes a hum at a certain uh, hertz, you know, and you, you can just kind of see it. It's like straight lines because it's, there's not a lot of variation here. We have a lot of human variation in the children playing. Then we have a siren down here. Again, we have like some, it's pretty consistent. Um, most of the energy right at a certain part along the spectrum. And I, I would think it's going to be the same. Uh, engine idling. Oh, here's a nice, really loud jackhammer file. That one's going to be painful to listen to. All right. So to summarize, what have we done so far today? We have... We've downloaded the urban sound data set. We've loaded up a training file that describes as all of the labels of the, the file names. We've, uh, we took a peek at the inside to see what the type of classes are available to us. We found that there's about 10 or maybe it's exactly 10. Um, we listened to one, we could listen to a few sound files and then we visualized at least, at least and visualize the sound in two different ways and determined that it's probably going to be more useful to have look at a histogram of audio file instead of a uh, this kind of classic audio representation. I don't know what we call this, just a time series of the data. From this study of the topic today, I think what I'm taking away from it is that I want to focus more on on a features that are produced via histogram. Okay, that's all I have time for for this video. We'll uh, hit back next time and continue to expand on this subject.